Okay, so um, I just want to have a conversation today. I spent four and a half years working on the Hill, three and a half years at the House Oversight Committee where I led the committee's oversight of healthcare programs and entitlement programs and where we did a lot of work on Medicaid. And what we were looking at mostly was the techniques that states use to inappropriately pass costs off on the federal government and how the federal government doesn't really do an effective job of doing oversight of uh, state Medicaid programs. So there's a lot of problems with Medicaid and it is the fastest growing program at the federal and state levels. So interrupt me, ask questions, whatever's on your mind. Uh, two main points on Medicaid. The first point is that Medicaid doesn't serve taxpayers or enrollees particularly well and needs fundamental reform. And if you're not convinced of that, I hope when you walk out of here today, you are convinced of that. The second, and something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and working on, is that the financing structure leads states um, to figure out ways to bring loads of federal tax dollars into their state with relatively little incentive for how well that money is spent. Okay, one of the key things, I'm gonna go through a couple main sort of basic things to know about Medicaid. Some of you uh, may know all this. Um, uh, some of you may know some of this. I'm sure some of you know um, some of this. Um, first thing to realize is that there's an uncapped federal reimbursement of state Medicaid spending. Okay, before the Affordable Care Act, so for, for traditional Medicaid populations, and traditional Medicaid populations are lower income children, and uh, generally their mothers, pregnant women, disabled, so if you're on uh, supplemental um, security income, SSI, you qualify for Medicaid, and also lower income seniors. You can be what's called dual eligibles, and you're on Medicaid and Medicare. The reimbursement percentage is based on state per capita income. So the wealthiest states receive a 50% reimbursement. The poorest states typically receive about a 75% reimbursement. On average, if you look back from sort of when Medicaid um, uh, started in 1965 through 2013 before the ACA Medicaid expansion, uh, the national average was about 57%. Now some years that went up uh, during times of economic recession, Congress often found that one way to get aid to states was by increasing the Medicaid reimbursement. So most recently that happened in the uh, stimulus that passed in 2009. That significantly increased the Medicaid reimbursement for states and that was one of the ways the federal government tried to get more money to states um, who were suffering obviously f from, the, uh, from the recession. The ACA added a new mandatory population Right, everyone below 133% of the federal poverty level. As was mentioned in the previous panel, in 2012 the Supreme Court in a 7-2 decision said that was, um, uh, Congress didn't have the authority to make that Medicaid expansion mandatory. Uh, John Roberts in his decision said that's like holding a loaded gun to the state's head because you were, they were threatening to take away all state Medicaid funding for states that didn't expand, so they made that an optional population. But there was a large incentive for states to expand Medicaid in the ACA. From 2014 to 2016, the federal reimbursement rate was 100% for the expansion population. It starts in 2017 to gradually decline. In 2020, it is 90%, and that's the rate that it stays at indefinitely. <clears throat> uh, Medicaid has mandatory versus optional benefits. I, lift, I listed some of those there. Uh, states. Many states expand their Medicaid programs to cover more than the mandatory benefits. This slide, which uh, is um, too small a font, unfortunately, shows uh, Medicaid spending by enrollment group. So here are the percentage of enrollees. You can see 48%, I'll read the numbers out, 48% of enrollees in 2013, so this is before the expansion in the ACA, were children, 25% were non-disabled, non-elderly adults, 17% uh, people with disabilities, and 9% um, uh, people who are over the age of 65. 
And you can see, um, so uh, Obamacare, what the ACA did, and uh, I'll use ACA and Obamacare back and forth, um, was expand generally this area. So this is going to be much larger now if these numbers were you know, updated for fiscal year 2015. Uh, even though children were about 50% of enrollment, it's relatively small piece of total expenditures, right? Children are relatively cheap to cover. Um, just 20% of total expenditures. Uh, Non-disabled adults, also pre-ACA, a relatively cheap population to cover. 16% of total Medicaid expenditures. Here are the sort of two um, uh, big pieces, the aged and the disabled, total about two-thirds of Medicaid expenditures. Okay, the Medicaid program is growing rapidly. This, these figures here show inflation-adjusted amounts. So this is, when you see the uh, 1970 here, um, this is what the equivalent dollars would be in 2015. So the graph is not um, spaced perfectly here. So you see 1970 to 2000, there's a, um, there's a pretty big jump. Um, and then if you start in 2000, we're tracing every year this area right here, this spike is going to be the um, uh, Medicaid expansion. And you see it's just continues its um, upward trend. Uh, CBO in January released their uh, numbers, estimated numbers for 2015, and they have the federal spending at uh, $350 billion. And they said that uh, the federal government now, remember the historic average was 57%. They said in 2015, federal share was 63%, which is a huge increase. Um, it may seem like only a 6% increase, but when you think about the magnitude of the dollars, it's a huge increase. Um, so we have th about $350, $350 billion in federal Medicaid expenditures, um, about $555 billion total in 2015 um, uh, when you include the state share. Uh, enrollment is largely driving the increase in expenditures. So this shows uh, enrollment from 1965 through 2015. Again, you see, um, so you see, so one of the interesting things is from 1975 through 1990, enrollment was relatively flat, but starting in 1990, um, we have had uh, lots of state Medicaid expansions prior to the ACA, right? States have just expanded Medicaid um, eligibility. And then you have this most recent spike here with the um, Affordable Care Act population. Another really interesting story with Medicaid is that states' programs are very different and states spend a lot, uh, dramatically different amounts on enrollees. So what I did was, and this data comes from uh, Kaiser, and I think it is... Mm, it's, either, it's 2011, 2012, or 2013 data. And what I did was show the top two states in spending per enrollee among the four categories and the bottom two states. So you can see um, average Medicaid spending per aged enrollee. Wyoming and North Dakota are both over $30,000. And Illinois and North Carolina are just over $10,000. Right, so a three to one ratio between the highest spending states and the lowest spending states for aged enrollees. Disabled enrollees, right? New York and Connecticut, both over $30,000 per disabled enrollee. Georgia and Alabama, um, just over $10,000. So again, a three to one ratio. Um, average spending per adult enrollee. Uh, New Mexico and Montana, both above $6,500. Maine and Iowa at the bottom, just above $2,000. Again, a three to one ratio. Yes, non-disabled adults, yes. Um, and then uh, children enrollees, uh, Vermont and Alaska at the top of the list, Florida and Wisconsin um, at the bottom. And again, you see more than a three to one ratio, right? So the differences are dramatic. One of the reasons for um, the federal financing to work the way it did was so these differences wouldn't be as dramatic, right? The theory behind giving poorer states a higher reimbursement is that that state tax base is going to be less able to finance Medicaid expenditures, right, than a wealthier state like um, New York or Connecticut, right? They're very wealthy states. So the federal government's going to send money from New York and Connecticut 
to poorer states like um, Georgia and Alabama to, um, uh, to help those states spend more. And one of the things that we're seeing is that that hasn't worked very well, right? These wealthier states are, um, instead of the transfer going this way, right, these wealthy states spend so much, right? So look at New York. They're getting 50% of their spending reimbursed by federal taxpayers. So federal taxpayers are spending um, half of $34,000, so $17,000 goes from the federal government to New York for each disabled enrollee. Alabama has a 70% um, reimbursement rate. So Alabama is receiving $7,000 per disabled enrollee. Okay, so $17,000 going to New York for di per disabled enrollee, $7,000 to Alabama. Right, so the federal share of these expenditures is also uh, much different and hasn't worked out in the way that sort of when they came up with the um, FMAP formula um, th that it was designed to work. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I think the reason is because um, uh, these states have a um, wealthier state tax base and they have just been able to spend more. So even though they receive a lower reimbursement percentage, because they're spending so much more from their own state tax base, they are receiving more in federal contributions even though they have a lower reimbursement percentage. Does that answer your question? Um, that's a good question, um, uh, and the answer is probably generally no, um, but certainly something that, that, that needs to be studied, right, is whether, whether this, this leads to better outcomes. Now, you would think it does lead to probably um, uh, nicer nursing homes in Wyoming and North Dakota than in Illinois and North Carolina, right? I would expect that. Right, because these are largely, I mean, spending per agent enrollees for Medicaid is largely going into nursing homes. Um, and that's something I should mention is that Medicaid covers um, uh, an enormous amount of long-term care expenditures in the U.S. So about 70% of long-term care expenditures are paid through either Medicaid or Medicare. Medicare will pay for the first 100 days in a skilled nursing facility, right, a nursing home, but after that Medicaid um, picks up the uh, uh, picks up the responsibility for, for reimbursing. So I think it's between 40 and 50 percent of, um, of uh, long-term care expenditures is f are financed in the U.S. through Medicaid. Okay, <clears throat> this slide, these next three slides, I um, uh, created late last night to, to sort of walk you through uh, the financing here. So they're not in uh, probably in Mercatus format. So the graphic arts people in Mercatus will be very mad at me, but oh well. Um, consider a state with a 60% federal match rate, right? That's the typical scenario. If a state spends a dollar of its own funds, okay, it gets a dollar fifty from the federal government. Okay, why? Because 60% of two dollars and fifty cents is a dollar fifty. Right? One of my dissertation advisors, I put this in my dissertation and I needed to explain this to him because he thought that, um, no, a 60% a match rate, they're not going to get $1.50. Right? But they actually do. It actually looks like they're getting 50% more um, uh, from the federal government, and they are. Right? But that's because the uh, percentage is on the total. Okay? So a state spends a dollar of its own funds, they get $1.50 from the federal government. Now think about it the other way. A state is having budget problems. Okay, and they're trying to figure out where are we going to trim spending. In order for the state to save a dollar, okay, they need to cut their Medicaid program by $2.50. Okay, so when states are making decisions about you know, what to cut, are we going to cut from Medicaid, education, transportation, corrections, infrastructure, right? the way that the federal financing works makes it very difficult for them to cut from the Medicaid program because right, they're taking an additional $1.50 out for each dollar um, that they cut from the, um, uh, from the state. Okay, so the conclusion is, just with the way this formula works, is the open-ended reimbursement makes it very easy to grow Medicaid. Um, see, and if uh, someone had checked that, I would have not um, put a bad word in there. Uh, makes it very easy to grow Medicaid and very difficult to cut it. Okay, this slide. <clears throat> 
um, is uh, what I put together to show state expenditure growth from 1990 through 2015. So it includes, and the 1990 values are adjusted for the increase in the consumer price index. So basically, um, it's basically about a two to, it's almost a two to one ratio, not quite where um, uh, things are on average two, two times more expensive than they were in 1990. Okay. Um, states spent, and this is not 1.8 million, right? These would be in the uh, trillions. So states spent $1.88 trillion in 2015. Okay, of that, $362 billion on elementary and secondary education, $193 billion on higher ed, $512 billion on Medicaid, um, 143 billion on transportation and 661 billion in on other stuff. This, by the way, includes federal funds that the state receives. So it's what the fe it's what states spend from their own tax base as well as what they get in terms of federal funding. Has a percentage of exp state expenditures in 2015. Medicaid is by far the biggest, 27.4 percent. Um, the second biggest is elementary and secondary education at 19.3 percent. Higher ed, 10.3%, transportation, 7.7%, and other, 35.3%. And we can send you this PowerPoint, so you don't need to um, jot this stuff down. In 1990, again, same dollar values, okay? States spent $900 billion. Of that, so in 1990, they were spending significantly more in elementary and secondary education than they were on Medicaid, okay? 205 um, billion dollars on elementary and secondary education, which was about 23% of state spending. Higher ed, $109 billion, which was 12.2%. Um, Medicaid was $112 billion, 12.5%. And you can see the, um, uh, the values for transportation and other. Okay, what this last row represents is the increase from 1990 to 2015. So basically, it's just dividing this number by this number and subtracting one. So it's showing you the percent increase. So overall, state expenditures have increased a lot, right? They've more than doubled. They've gone up 108%. What's driving that? <coughs> Medicaid. Medicaid expenditures um, have grown 357%, uh, again, in inflation-adjusted terms, 357% between 1990 and 2015. All the other increases are uh, much smaller. I think it's primarily due to states increasing enrollment. So part of it is going to be higher, um, higher health care prices and health care inflation growing higher than these things. But think higher education has had a lot of inflation since 1990, right? So these things are also susceptible to large price increases. Um, most of it is just much larger state Medicaid programs, right? Many more enrollees. So I guess what we can see, if we go back to this slide, here is Medicaid enrollment in 1990, right? Probably, it looks like probably just under 30 million. And in 2015, we're at 70 million, right? So Medicaid enrollment more than doubled between um, uh, 1990 and 2015. But I mean, it's at the same time, it's like, well, the population's growing as well. So that's like, do we have a per capita graph? Um, we do not have a per capita graph. That would have been a good graph um, to have. Has a percentage of the population. Uh, Medicaid now is so 70 million divided by 315, so it's over 20 percent. I would say back in 1990, it was probably about 13 percent of the population. So probably about a 7, 8 percent increase. Good question. This is, looks identical to this. Um, previous slide, but this just shows federal funding for states, okay? And the emphasis, the point of this is just to show you how much um, federal funding has increased over time with Medicaid relative to um, federal funding for uh, the other aspects of um, the state budgets. So in 2015, Washington sent uh, close to $600 billion to states. Of the $586 billion that Washington sent to states, $317 billion of it was through Medicaid. 
Okay, so 54%, more than half of all the money that we send to states goes through Medicaid, right? You can see the percentages here. 9.2% um, of what Washington sends to states is on elementary and secondary education. 3.6% for higher ed. 7.2% for transportation. Okay, if you look at in um, 1990, Washington was still the most, uh, the category of uh, um, one, I think one observation here is we send a lot more money. In, and again, these are inflation adjusted dollars. We send about three times as much money to states as we did in 1990. Okay, on Medicaid, we are sending um, uh, a really, I mean, it's the, the difference is dramatic, right? 64 billion to 317 billion. So we're sending more than $250 billion to states through Medicaid than we did 25 years ago. Okay, it's a 400% increase. Um, other areas of um, uh, spending have grown, right? Particularly, look at higher education is up over 200%. But still, they are dwarfed compared to what's gone on with federal funding for Medicaid. Okay, uh, second thing, and this was talked touched on in um, the previous previous panel, the research on the value of Medicaid. So this is um, Trevor's hand. Trevor's in the back. He's our hand model at Mercatus. Uh, we were we have very smart people at Mercatus. And when I was giving a talk uh, two or three weeks ago and was practicing the talk, I went talking about this new study by these economists. And these are economists at um, MIT, Harvard, and Dartmouth. Right? And this is the study, The Value of Medicaid, Interpreting Results from the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. It's like, we have to talk about this study. right? This study is really important. They estimated the value of Medicaid recipients. And it's only 20 to 40 cents on the dollar that Medicaid recipients receive. And, um, uh, one of our uh, communications experts was like, you need a visual with that. You need two dimes in a hand. So Trevor went and scoured the internet to find a picture of a hand with two dimes. And surprisingly, there are no pictures on the internet of a hand holding two dimes. So uh, Trevor um, took a picture of his hand with two dimes in it. And that is the visual that Mercatus brings out to show the value of Medicaid, right? 20 cents on the dollar. Um, the Oregon Medicaid experiment, um, and I think Megan listed some of, the, uh, um, some of the results from the Oregon Medicaid experiment. It's not a perfect experiment for one, right? Because a lot of people who won the lottery did not take steps to enroll. So there was a limited number of spots. People um, won the lottery and were able to get Medicaid or lost the lottery and weren't able to get Medicaid. And I mean, one of, one of the things that, uh, when it was 40% of people who won the lottery didn't enroll. So that shows you one thing, and that gives you sort of one data point on the value that people place on Medicaid. Of the people that did win the lottery and enroll, right, they found that they were much more likely to use healthcare services, right, including both preventative services and um, ERs. Uh, the big finding was no statistically significant effect. They look at th looked at three measures, blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar. Three things that you would expect if you're getting regular medical care, right? You would see a reduction in these three things. Um, uh, no effect, no statistically significant effect on any of those outcomes, and uh, the Medicaid did not reduce the risk of a heart problem. There were two benefits to, so, so no physical health benefits to Medicaid um, when you compared the Medicaid population with the, uh, popu the control group that didn't receive Medicaid. Okay, it did uh, re reduce um, the rates of depression, I think by 30%. And people felt um, uh, like better off financially, that they weren't worrying about uh, having medical expenses. A lot has been written about Medicaid's quality of care. Yes? Uh, it's a good question. So this, the lottery was in 2008, and the, this study came out in 2013. So I would think at most four. Okay. 
I mean, is there any sort of study on money that we saved because folks went to the emergency room or had emergency medical interventions that the state didn't have to pay for because they had Medicaid plans? I mean, that would seem like a much more measurable, you know, you're looking at three health conditions that are complicated and have to be fixed in the long period of mm -hmm. time instead of discrete, more easy to measure interventions. So, um, so you're asking two questions there. Uh, the first, it's a, they're very good questions. What you'd want to do is to study at different points in time, right, and follow these people over a short period of time and then also follow them over a longer period of time. The problem with looking at a longer period of time is that people change coverage, right? And over time, a lot more other ex expl explanatory factors can come in. And also in 2014, I mean, you can't really go past 2014 because in 2014 you have the ACA Medicaid expansion. So there are some. Medicaid has diabetes, right, which many of the folks might produce because most likely they have poor eating habits, not a lot of access to maybe the right nutrition for many years. Thank and you. Then I'm not taking the experiment. I'm reporting what they, um, know, what the findings of the experiment I'm are. I'm wondering, it just doesn't seem like it's like a good indicator of the success of the program. So it is very hard to determine on a um, causal basis, right? You give someone Medicaid, do they have better health outcomes? Because there are lots of other factors that affect people's health status whether they have Medicaid or not, so right? Whether your, your age, yeah, I mean, med, so Medicaid studies that try to assess factors responsible for health outcomes are fraught with problems, right? One of the reasons that economists really like the idea of the Oregon experiment is because you had random assignment. So the lottery enabled for not a perfect, it wasn't a perfect experiment, right? But it enabled some sort of control for these unobservable characteristics, right? All of these, like most of these studies, and I'm about to get into this now, the people with Medicaid generally have worse outcomes from healthcare treatments than people with private insurance. Well, people with Medicaid are different from people with private insurance. Some ways you can control for, right? You can control for income, you can control for age, right? You can control for gender, you can control for whether someone's a smoker, um, but there's a lot of other factors that you can't control for. So you should always take these, you should always be somewhat skeptical on any of these studies that show health benefits or that don't show health benefits. The best study, right, was what I, I mentioned earlier, the RAND health experiment that had a random assignment and followed people for a period of time. And what they did was group um, individuals in four classes based on cost sharing. And the first finding is, yeah, people who had more generous insurance used a lot more health care. Right? But then the second finding, they looked at hundreds of metrics, and Megan mentioned they only found two with a statistically significant outcome. I'll just jump in. Um, okay, this is all. Those three disease states you see throughout a lot of the, uh, the, the measures to indicate what is good health, um, you see it in NCCA PBS measures uh, for Medicaid managed care plans as well as CMS's uh, dog program measures. So I just, um, I, I don't know that I'm not Brian knows this study better than I do, but I would guess that those three disease states are typically kind of the standard of what you measure for, for proxies of better health. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, okay, so good. So now we've gone through uh, the first bullet there in much more detail than I was um, going to talk about, so that's very good. Um, thank you for that question. Oh, the other question you asked was on, um, uh, I was on cost. And what we've seen with Medicaid expansion generally is um, because many in many states, and this is very state specific, right? Because some states pay Medicaid providers better than other states. Um, but in, in, in many states, Medicaid enrollees have more limited access to a regular source of care and are more often to use like expensive places like emergency rooms. There was a, a 2011 um, article in the New York Times where Robert Pear went to Louisiana and found that people in Louisiana were having a very hard time accessing a usual source of care. And they would have a Medicaid card 
right? But very few people would, um, very few providers would accept those cards. And in fact, what we're seeing is that uh, Medicaid recipients are increasingly served by a subset of providers, right? And it's also a subset of providers that may not, that may be lower quality providers, right? And they don't have the same um, uh, standard of care has what, sort of other providers who see only private pay, um, uh, private pay people do. Um, I'll skip that slide. Okay, I spent three and a half years doing oversight work on the, um, uh, on the oversight committee on Medicaid. This was a lesson I learned before I joined the committee when I was a um, uh, health policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, I did a study of New York's long-term care Medicaid sort of complex. And we drove around the state of New York talking to um, providers, talking to interest groups, talking to Medicaid eligibility workers. And I learned that in New York, Medicaid is a verb. They're like, what, how, what is, what, how is Medicaid a verb? They're like, yeah, Medicaid it. Like, well, what does that mean? That means if you see a service that you think um, can reasonably be categorized as a Medicaid service and get the federal government to um, reimburse you for that service, you Medicaid it. You bring it, you have Medicaid pay for it, and then you bill the federal government, and the federal government sends you 50% of um, whatever the cost of that service is. Okay, all states. It's not just New York. New York sort of is very, they've developed very elaborate um, uh, scams. And I'll talk more about New York uh, in a little bit. But all states do this, right? 49 states have Medicaid provider taxes, right? They all have an incentive, like I said before, to minimize what the state's share of Medicaid expenditures is, try to make it look like they're actually making expenditures so that those expenditures are reimbursed by the federal government. This is our scenario where we show um, how provider taxes work. So in a world without provider taxes, right, a state is spending $100 on a provider. The provider is better off by $100. The state sends that bill to the federal government. Right, the federal government's like, all right, state, you have a 60% reimbursement rate. We're going to cut you a check for $60. Federal government sends $60 to the state, right, so that the state it's really um, share of that expenditure is only $40. The federal share is $60. Okay. The first thing to realize with provider taxes is that they shift costs to the federal government. So, I mean, one of the really interesting things on provider taxes is how often do you get groups that come to government and say, please tax me? <laughs> right? It's very rare. So you should think, oh, there's an interesting story behind, um, uh, behind phenomena like that. Okay, so what the provider does is works with the state, figures out, all right, state, I'm going to um, uh, assess a $100 tax on you. Okay, the state assesses a $100 tax, and the state pays the provider um, uh, $200, right? They pay them back the $100 in taxes, and they pay them the $100 that they originally paid the provider. So the provider is just as well off. The state, then, the federal government comes in, and they look at the $200 expenditure, okay, because that's what the state paid the provider. And the federal government then, instead of paying the $60, reimburses the state $120. So now the state's collected $120 from the federal government. It has um, collected $100 from the provider. It's paid the provider $200. You do the math. The state is actually um, benefiting by $20. And if you look at from the no provider tax scenario, they're actually the state is better off by $60. Okay, who's worse off by $60? Federal taxpayers. Okay, now that is um, assuming the provider taxes just shift the costs from states to the federal government. They certainly do shift the costs from the states from the federal government but they also increase overall Medicaid expenditures, right? They increase overall Medicaid expenditures because they make the state share of spending less significant, right? And when the state share of spending is lower, right, states have an incentive to spend more on Medicaid than they would um, uh, otherwise. 
show that the package we're asking for a waiver on is about the same cost that Medicaid would, the federal government would be paying to the state if we didn't have the waiver. So don't they have to somehow justify these things, or are they able to just tap into an unlimited source of reimbursement? So there's, there's two questions. Um, uh, let me break that up into two pieces. One, there's lots of rules on provider taxes. Okay, so the provider taxes are supposed to be broad-based and uniform, which means if you're um, a hospital, you have all the hospitals in the state, you can't just assess the um, tax on the hospitals that only serve Medicaid beneficiaries and then make those payments back to um, those hospitals, right? You have to assess the tax broadly on that entire class of hospitals um, in that in you know, the entire set of providers in that class, okay? And obviously some hospitals aren't gonna like the tax, right? Hospitals that have a lower number of Medicaid enrollees are not gonna receive the higher payment rates back through the provider tax mechanism. Now, states can receive waivers from those requirements. Okay, there's also, there's also a limit on how much um, the provider tax can be as a percentage of revenue. So states can't raise, providers Providers can't, um, states can't raise more than 6% of what their payments are to providers. And if you look at all states, basically states are mostly maxed out. They, they make as much in provider taxes as they can. But there's waivers, right? So states are allowed to apply to the Secretary of HHS for waivers around the uniform and broad rate based requirements. And states apply for them all the time, right? And states also make supplemental payments. If you're looking at Medicaid, there's two types of ways providers get money through Medicaid. They get money through regular payment rates. Right? And they also get money through supplemental payments. And supplemental payments are growing. And supplemental payments, there's actually very little federal oversight. Federal oversight of supplemental payments is very weak. GAO has written about this a ton. And it's those supplemental payments that the states can then deliver to individual providers. Um, when I was working at the Oversight Committee in 2014, we asked GAO to do some, well, we asked GAO to do work on this in 2012. And GAO takes 18 months to do everything. So in the summer of 2014, they came back with us. They looked at three states. They looked at Illinois, California, and New York. California doesn't have data on supplemental payments that they could provide to, to um, uh, GAO. So basically, California told the federal government, we have no idea. Um, we cannot tell you where this Medicaid money is going. We can't match up Medicaid payments on an individual provider basis. Right? That raises lots of questions. Um, Illinois and New York did provide this data. There were two hospitals in New York that received in one year close to half a billion dollars, billion, in supplemental payments, even though their Medicaid costs were estimated by GAO at at most $100 million. Those were, uh, I'll actually, I have those on the slide in a little bit. You also asked about um, waivers. And waivers, so there's, so those are the waivers that I'm talking about are different from sort of the 1115 waivers. So a lot of states have 1115 waivers that allow them to waive Medicaid requirements and receive federal reimbursements. Um, and those are supposed to be budget neutral. They are often not budget neutral. I'll give you an example of a, of a state that's not budget neutral. Um, and that's another concern that GAO has raised on these 1115 waivers is that they're often um, not budget neutral. Um, so the third scenario shows uh, what happens when uh, provider taxes increase the payments that the state makes to providers. And you would think, all right, the economics says that this is going to increase payment rates to providers. Providers are lobbying for these taxes. They're lobbying for them because they know they're getting higher payment rates. Um, so here we um, assumed, all right, let's say the providers, the state raises the provider rates by 50%. So the state is sending $250 to the provider. Uh, the federal government sees that $250 expenditure, reimburses 60% of it. So they're reimbursing $150. Um, the state received the $100 taxes, received the $150 from federal reimbursement, paid out $250. So they have a wash, right? So that means they're not spending anything from their state tax base. And if you compare scenario one and scenario three, it makes it pretty clear that states are better off from provider taxes, providers are better off from provider taxes, um, the federal government is worse off, okay? And there is a reason that all states but Alaska have provider taxes, right? And Alaska is, um, I hired a uh, law firm to 
or saw an accounting firm to figure out how to institute a provider tax next year. Okay, lesson number two for Medicaid oversight work. Um, Medicaid long-term care is available to just about everyone. So Medicaid long-term care has, there are supposed to be um, asset requirements on uh, Medicaid long-term care, but there is a huge number of exempt assets. Like you can have a house worth up to $750,000 and still qualify for Medicaid, right? Your house is an exempt asset. Um, you can have an, uh, an unlimited amount of money in an individual retirement account and still qualify for Medicaid. Right? I didn't realize the extent of this problem until I went and we did a, uh, we did a trip in Suffolk County, which is Long Island, and we talked to this woman, Janice Ulau, an assistant administrator of Medicaid services, and she told us it's, it's typical that people come in here owning a house, and it's Long Island, right? So they're owning a house worth half a million dollars, they have significant money in their retirement accounts, and they are qualifying for Medicaid, and Medicaid is paying for their long-term care services, either delivered at home or in the nursing home. Um, we had a hearing, um, so uh, Congressman Gowdy was our subcommittee chairman, and in uh, September 2011, we had a hearing, and Janice Ulau testified, and this is part of her testimony. She said, as a longtime employee of the local Medicaid office, I have had the opportunity to witness the diversion of applicants' significant resources in order to obtain Medicaid coverage. It is not at all unusual to encounter individuals and couples with resources beyond exempt resources. So that's the exempt resources would be the house, the IRA, um, exceeding a half a million dollars, some with over a million dollars. There is no attempt to hide that this money exists. There is no need. There are various legal means to prevent those funds from being used to pay for the applicant's nursing home care. Wealthy applicants for Medicaid's nursing home coverage consider that benefit to be their right, regardless of their ability to pay for themselves. If you want to um, get a whole bunch of fun um, uh, things to read on the internet, Google Medicaid estate planning. Right? It's a huge industry. And they basically, that's what they advertise, that they can, they can um, save you from spending down to qualify for Medicaid. Okay, lesson number three from uh, the Medicaid oversight work that I did on the Hill. The rules are really complicated, and CMS doesn't really know what states are doing. Uh, four examples. Number one, New York Developmental Centers. In 2010, a small uh, newspaper in New York, the Poughkeepsie Journal. Has anyone ever heard of the Poughkeepsie Journal? I had not heard of the Poughkeepsie Journal. The Poughkeepsie Journal um, wrote an article about facilities in the state of New York. They were called developmental centers. They were housing and treating people with developmental disabilities. The daily Medicaid payment rate for those individuals. Does anyone want to guess? How much? 100. Anyone else want to guess? Thousand. We're getting closer. Five thousand dollars daily payment rate for people housed in these developmental centers. Two million dollars per year. Uh, CMS, starting in 1993, started approving a state's change in a formula that has people would leave these facilities, right? The state would, the, the facility, and these facilities, by the way, are um, owned, they're operated by the state. So these are state facilities, okay? So that they would, um, uh, for each person that left, they would retain basically the cost. So over time, as enrollment declined in these facilities, the per patient um, rate skyrocketed, right? Which is why they kept all these facilities open. We found across, well, we didn't, I didn't discover the uh, Poughkeepsie Journal story. We discovered the IG reported on this, and they estimated these overpayments, and we read about it, and we're like, all right, we, we need to stop this. So we called a meeting with CMS, and we met with them in June 2012, and uh, we told them that this, what they were allowing to happen was theft, that they were allowing New York to steal from federal taxpayers, and CMS said that, uh, that's correct, but um, they were going to allow it to continue for five years because the state had become addicted to basically reliance on these funds. Um, uh, we weren't satisfied with that answer. You know, we um, uh, reported that to uh, Chairman Issa and Chairman Gowdy, and they, 
Uh, we drafted a letter. We sent it to CMS. We called a hearing. And at that hearing, they, they reversed course. And they said, no, we're going to, um, we've had a change of heart. We're going to end these overpayments. And um, we're going to, uh, and we said, well, you should. So we did, has anyone heard of uh, Medicaid upper payment limits? So Medicaid policy, again, is really complicated. Medicaid is prevented from paying more than what Medicare would pay for um, like equivalent services. Um, and it's really complicated to figure out, well, is Medicaid actually paying more than Medicare? No one, no one really knows how, how to figure these things out. That said, I made an estimate that these overpayments started in 1990 and went on through 2011. And the federal share of the overpayments for that two decades was $15 billion, okay, just for these facilities in New York, right, which was a small part of New York's overall Medicaid program. Um, CMS eventually um, went after the state for two years of those overpayments and collected over, over $2 billion back from um, the state. Okay, so that was, uh, that was the day that I said I saved the uh, federal taxpayers more than a billion dollars. And when I asked for a salary increase and was denied. <laughs> but the point of this story is that states, the state knew what it was doing, right? It knew, it, it knew that it was these, these facilities were a cash cow, right? And CMS was either oblivious or um, beyond negligent in allowing it to happen. Second case, Minnesota managed care. So at this, um, uh, we had a hearing. So in uh, 2010 or 2011, some people in Minnesota started, so sort of whistleblowers in Minnesota, started raising concerns that managed care, the state was paying um, uh, companies to deliver Medicaid managed care way too much, right? way above what the actuarial value of that spending would be. And Trevor, do I have the, um, those? And what raised uh, Senator Grassley's um, concern, he led this investigation, was a um, refund that one of these insurance companies gave to the state. Right. Have you heard of the insurance company saying, Medicaid's paying us too much, so we have to uh, return money to the state. So they decided to return $30 million to the state because they received too much in Medicaid payments. And this is what the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health and Human Services emailed another person um, in that department about the proper way to discuss this. She wrote, in order to have a good chance of keeping all this money, it must be characterized as a donation. If a refund, feds clearly get half. Can you work with Scott on redrafting? Also, I thought we were going to handle this through phone calls. Right, so when you, get a, when you get an email like that and you're working on congressional oversight, you're like, you know, hot dang, we're going to have this person come and testify. Um, and she did come and testify. And what Minnesota was doing was very creative. They were overpaying the companies for Medicaid. They had state-only health plans in Minnesota. They were underpaying insurers for those state-only health plans. They made a requirement that if you are going to um, uh, participate in Medicaid, you need to participate in these state-only health plans. So what was happening? There was a cross-subsidy coming in, right? The federal reimbursement coming in through Medicaid was cross-subsidizing these state-only health insurance plans. Um, when we wrote to CMS about it, we're like, what, w w did you know what's going on? Because CMS, they're supposed to certify that the rates are actuarially sound. They're like, well, we didn't know what was going on, right? This is, we, we, we approved the rates, but really we, we didn't know what, what they were doing. Um, third example, braces in Texas. Um, an investigative journalist out of Dallas did a report in... I guess early 2012, called Crooked Teeth. And the motivation was all of these little um, dental Medicaid shops were popping up and putting braces on everybody, um, all these kids. They were doing root canals on like toddlers. I mean, the stuff that they were doing was, was uh, abominable. Um, Texas 
spent Medicaid programs, so met braces are generally not a medical necessity unless um, uh, you like have some like major problem with your, with your teeth. And there was supposed to be a review process where people, or in order to get Medicaid, you would you know, get, get examined and Medicaid would sign off on it. Well, it was just a rubber stamp process where everyone at the state agency um, that you know, applied through this process, they just, they just got braces. Um, again, federal government had no idea what was going on, right? Until this was highlighted, we had a hearing, and then a whole bunch of investigations happened. And actually, I haven't followed, I, I don't know what the, what the conclusion of all this was. I know there is um, some, some lawsuits have been brought against certain, um, uh, certain of these practices in Texas and in other states. The last one is health insurance tax. Is anyone familiar, seen the news stories on the health, in, the Medicaid, uh, this is a provider tax. Um, on insurers in California recently. So, uh, like I said, on provider taxes, it is supposed to be broad-based. So you're not supposed to just single out Medicaid managed care companies and assess the tax on them. But states like California and Pennsylvania, that's what they were doing, right? So if you were an insurance company, you weren't selling out uh, um, uh, Medicaid, you weren't facing any pain from this tax. So it was really just an explicit um, uh, uh, kickback to managed care companies in California. Federal government, in July 2014, the um, uh, administrator at CMS, I guess the Medicaid director at CMS, Cindy Mann, sent a letter out that said, um, it was generic, it said, we've heard a lot of states are out of compliance with this tax um, and you need to come into compliance. Well, it turns out that California was out of compliance um, and that there was a risk of, was it like a billion and a half dollar hole in the California budget? And they just came to some agreement on it, and I'm not sure what the specifics of the agreement are, but there is a quote in the story from someone involved with the negotiations, and her quote is basically, this, what we did was so complicated, I don't even understand what it is, right? And when you have someone saying this is so complicated, I don't understand what it is, right, you should think, all right, well, who's, who understands the complications, right? Well, it's the interests that are gonna benefit from this. Uh, this was a report that um, I have on here. In 2013, the Oversight Committee released a bipartisan, um, released a committee report, right? Two committee reports in the four years that Daryl Issa was chairman. Um, this was one of the reports. It was on uh, misspending within New York's Medicaid program, and it highlighted um, the developmental center example that I discussed, as well as numerous other um, things that the committee found and highlighted how New York was um, sort of inflating costs and passing these bills to federal taxpayers. Lesson number four, and I think this is like really important and goes against conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is Medicaid underpays providers. And that is certainly true in some cases. I think it's generally true for primary care in several states. Um, but when you look at one, a lot of institutions have lobbied for Medicaid expansion. If Medicaid really underpaid, why would they want a larger Medicaid presence um, in their state? Uh, and then you have this example um, of, uh, so, so I think the story is some providers in Medicaid are underpaid, but a lot of organized providers in Medicaid, hospitals, nursing homes, they are not underpaid. Uh, you have dish payments, you have supplemental payments that are pretty significant. You have the example that I um, uh, gave in New York City of these two hospitals, Collar Memorial and Collar Goldwater, that received um, the $500 million in supplemental payments for um, uh, you know, less than $100 million in, in costs. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up, Trevor. Big question for thinking about reform, right? I think. The program needs reform. Um, it, we're spending a lot of money. I don't think we're getting um, results from the program that justify all the money. I mean, I'm an economist. I think, well, what are the incentives? We need to realign the incentives in the program. So how can we realign the incentives to get more value for less spending? Um, we also have to think this program is like so humongous and complicated. Does it make sense to have a program for lower income kids and um, their moms grouped with seniors who have long-term care needs, right? Um, uh, is, there a, is there a different way to think about that? 
I think um, uh, the biggest problem in Medicaid policy is the open-ended reimbursement of state Medicaid expenditures, right? It disincentivizes both states and the federal government from really caring whether we're getting good value for this program. Um, I think it obviously biases state decisions in the favor of Medicaid at the expense of other state priorities like education, transportation, um, infrastructure. Uh, provider taxes. Um, I just wrote a paper on, that we released on Tuesday on Medicaid provider taxes. One of the things I really try to do in the paper is emphasize that there is some bipartisan agreement on the problem of Medicaid provider taxes. Both the Bush and Obama administrations have proposed um, reducing the amount that states can raise through provider taxes. The Bowles-Simpson Commission, right, if you're looking for big bipartisan ideas, it's one big Medicaid idea was to um, uh, eliminate provider taxes. Vice President Biden, right, in uh, 2011 during the budget and deficit talks, Vice Pe President Biden um, expressed support for scrapping them. So the, the, my Forbes piece this week was titled, Biden was right, it's time to scrap the provider tax scam. Biden in um, Bob Woodward's accounting referred to provider taxes as a scam and something that Congress and the administration should be able to come to agreement on. Uh, finally, and I skipped, um, I skipped this slide because I'm out of time. This is an, uh, to, to your question on 1115 waivers being budget neutral. Arizona received an 1115 waiver in 2001. And if you look at Arizona Medicaid spending and U.S. Medicaid spending from 97 to 2001, it basically tracks. And then in 2001, Arizona received its 1115 waiver. And that's what happened to Medicaid spending in Arizona versus the rest of the country. It increased, um, you know, at two, three times the rate. So thank you.